I'm gonna give you the four best exercises that every athlete should be doing, and we're gonna start right now. Okay, so if we're gonna be talking about what are the best exercises that every athlete can do, we have to think about what do athletes need. Okay, so if we have field hockey player, uh, a lacrosse player, a swimmer, a football player, a wrestler, a shot putter, a basketball player, that's seven different sports, and they're all different, right? They're all different in their own regard. They're all different in the way that their sport is executed and played. So we have to look at, all right, if we're gonna lump seven of these athletes together and pick four of the best exercises for them, how can we determine what those key characteristics are gonna be. And we know, okay, we need technical coordination. And the reason why we need technical coordination is because we need to be training maximal rate of force development, okay? So we're gonna improve force development. Uh, we're gonna try to improve mobility. We know athletes need mobility. We know they need chaos coordination, okay? Chaos coordination so that it improves open skilled athletes. We also need to focus on transient speed so that transient speed being quick with very short bursts, okay? It's a little bit different from the type of speed that we're gonna see on the track. Transient speed as we've talked about in the past is what we'll see with basketball players, with wrestlers, that speed that's sort of undefined, but everybody knows, it's more along the lines of being agile. And then we're gonna need a little bit more of an isolation so that we can improve stability and structural integrity. So we know all of those aspects are key to developing those seven different athletes, right? We know that that's key. So how can we start to break down? All right, let's go, four exercises what exercises can cover all of those key characteristics. Let's go into that first key exercise. So that first key exercise that you need to do, that every athlete needs to do, and that every coach doesn't wanna teach you because they think it's too hard, okay? That first key exercise is the snatch, okay? One of the big factors that I've seen, especially when we're talking about these example athletes, a lot of football players actually learn how to snatch easier than they learn how to clean because they're so tight in their wrists, they're so tight in their upper back, it's easier for them to put the snatch into position than it is to actually clean. So let's go over the characteristics of what we see from an adaptation perspective with the snatch. We know that we're gonna target the posterior chain. We know that the hamstrings are gonna get lit up, the quads will get lit up on the finish. We know that the athlete learns chaos coordination. They learn how to coordinate rapidly. We know that the reflexive strength is gonna improve. We know drop time off of a snatch can actually enhance those central pattern generators because of the speed of the movement. That drop time is gonna be about 0.4 seconds. We also know that once you get proficient enough in the snatch technique that your mobility improves, your ankle mobility, your shoulder mobility, your lower back mobility, and we also learn the skills of toe contractions in your shoulder girdle and in your knee joint when you're finishing and catching that high speed movement. And that takes us to that last key aspect, is it's a high speed exercise, okay? So it's a really excellent movement that every athlete should be doing. And this doesn't mean that you have to do full snatches. You could be doing high hang power snatches. You could do two box power snatches. You could just do a power snatch in general. You could do a dumbbell snatch, anything to improve your overall coordination. And that's that number one key exercise that every athlete should be doing. Now, what's that next exercise? What can piggyback on top of that snatch that's gonna help you improve as an athlete. And that second key exercise is going to be the Bulgarian split squat. Although there's nothing Bulgarian about it. I hate that everybody calls it the Bulgarian split squat, but we refer to it here as the single leg squat for everybody's sake, the Bulgarian split squat. Now, what are we looking for? What are the gains that we're trying to see? We talked about what every athlete needs and one of those aspects was isolation. So one of the reasons why I like to use the single leg squat is because it sort of cheat codes your posterior chain. It forces you into this unstable situation. So we know we're gonna be focusing and improving our stability, which is key. We know that we can also enhance structural integrity because we can see with an athlete, all right, their left side's very unstable relative to their right side. So now we can improve that. That's gonna enhance overall coordination. 
we also can target the hamstrings and the glutes together very, very well. Few people will execute a Bulgarian split squat and not be sore in their glutes and in their hamstrings the day after. Now that doesn't mean that you have to be sore to see muscular improvement, but it does show you a lot of people will wake up different parts of their body when they're doing the single leg squat. So you will improve mobility in your hip, you'll improve mobility in your quads, you'll improve mobility in your glutes. And these are all key components that can help us enhance chaos coordination in our field play, our court play, whatever it is that we're focusing on. So do Bulgarian split squats, AKA single leg squats, at least once a week, I recommend you know four or five sets four to five reps on each leg. Now that third key exercise. I've been known to say that if I was on a deserted island, my favorite hypothetical situation, and I could only pick two exercises, this would be one of those key exercises. And I've gotten some flack in the past and I don't care. That third key exercise is going to be the bench press. Okay, so, oh my gosh, everybody's losing their mind. The bench press is a key upper body movement. I will say, if I had the swimmer scenario, okay, so out of those seven exercises, I did mention the swimmer, okay, the swimmer, I would probably replace the bench press with a pull-up. Pull-up, I sort of equate as the squat of the upper body. The bench press, I sort of believe, can be trained more so with higher speeds. Uh, it's very fast twitch, so you can train it almost as a poor man's technical coordination exercise. If you're manipulating reps properly and you're doing high speed movements, you're doing pad bench, you're doing unbroken reps as well, you can really change the rep scheme very, very well to elicit the positive response that you're looking for. That's why I love the bench, okay? So if we're gonna be focusing on increasing max strength in our pecs and in our shoulders and in our triceps, these are all key muscular groups for sports. You know, pummeling if we're wrestlers, stiff arms or, or blocking if we're talking about offensive linemen. Shot putters benefit tremendously from upper body strength in their pecs. If we're focusing on max strength, it can improve if we're focusing on speed. It can also enhance hypertrophic gains if we're doing higher reps as well. Now, a lot of people might say, well, you mentioned mobility. This could really suffer if we're not doing anything else. This takes us back to that crazy deserted island discussion, okay? If we're on a deserted island and we have two exercises, bench press and snatch. If I'm snatching, my shoulders will remain mobile. My thoracic extension will be able to be enhanced from those snatches. If I could only pick two movements, it would be a snatch and a bench all the time. Okay, regularly, because that's gonna enhance your speed, it's gonna enhance your mobility in your upper back and your hypertrophic gains at the exact same time. So bench press, it's a phenomenal exercise if you pinpoint the right rep ranges and you pinpoint the right way to manipulate the rep. And that takes us to our fourth key exercise that every single athlete should do. And this is another one that everybody's gonna be crying about because they don't wanna do it. This is another exercise that's challenging. It bust down the ego. But remember, if we only have four movements, we're trying to think about transfer of training. How do these movements transfer to other exercises so it sort of covers the gamut of movements, right? That's what we have to think about based off of our time in the gym, based off of transferring to sport. Uh, if we're limited by time, all these things. That key exercise is gonna be the front squat. So a lot of people are gonna cry that they can't get to that front rack position. I'm gonna be one of those. But the first thing that you can do is watch our video where we actually covered how can you improve your front squat rack. So once you watch that video, you can learn how to open up your wrists, your upper back, your elbows, your triceps, your lats, everything, okay? So why do I love the front squat? The front squat carries over very, very well to jumping. A lot of research has shown us that front squat is a key indicator for speed. Front squat's a key indicator for speed. Also, our unilateral strength was covered with the Bulgarian split squat. Now we're covering the bilateral strength with the front squat. Front squats also transfer really well to back squats. It's also a little bit easier on your knees. It's gonna improve your ankle mobility. It's gonna enhance that dynamic trunk control, and that's gonna transfer very, very well to various different sports, to all seven of those sports, okay? Now, if I'm dealing with basketball players or volleyball players, I also like to front squat 
because back squat's much more challenging for them because they're longer limbed. Even front squat to a point, I would recommend, you know, if they struggle with getting that front rack position, lighten the load, get them to achieve that front rack position. It's gonna carry over to their cleans really well. If they can achieve that front rack position, go classic bodybuilder style or even zombie squats. Zombie squats are one of those exercises where you tell athletes, oh, you can't front rack it? All right, we'll just do zombie squats. And then they start to do zombie squats and magically they can all of a sudden front rack again because they realize front rack's a lot easier than a zombie squat. So that's a little key trick that you can use as a coach. But also if you're dealing with really, really tall athletes, have them squat down to a box where they have to gently sit on the box and drive up, okay? So we have to understand what's the key goal, what's the, the response that we're looking for with each athlete. Some athletes, basketball, volleyball, they don't need to be front squatting 350 pounds, 400 pounds. They just need to be front squatting 135 to 200 pounds to improve their mobility, to help them with their landing, to increase their dynamic trunk control. That's all that needs to happen. So if we understand the benchmarks, now we can know where we need to go with each movement using the basketball player again. We can do high hang power snatches and that's all that they need to do. They don't need to catch that in the hole. Now, if we have a shot putter, ideally they're gonna catch that snatch down in the hole. Same thing if we're dealing with wrestlers. Ideally, they'll catch that snatch down in the hole. Use all of these movements to enhance chaos coordination, to improve transient speed, to improve mobility, to improve absolute strength and relative strength. But make sure that you know what type of adaptation you're looking for with each and every exercise. If you need help and you're trying to figure out, all right, how do I take these exercises and put it into a program? I need to know, you know, I saw that Dane said that linear periodization sucks. What can we do to improve our periodization or how do we put these into a giant puzzle? You can click on the link down below. You can go to garagestrength.com. You can pick up our Sports Performance Bible book and course. This is a book and course that we put together that helps you understand how we're looking for different forms of adaptation and how each and every part of training can all get fit together into this grand scheme to help you be a better coach or be a better athlete. And remember, when we're getting in and we're focusing on each exercise, we always have to be ready to cultivate your power. Peace.